1967, which was in this committee back in January. We referred it down the hall to finance where amendments were made. Uh, we received the bill back and did a walkthrough with council on um, Tuesday, uh, late Tuesdays, and talked to a member of finance. So we've uh, had a look at the bill. Now we're um, checking back in with all of you, most of you we spoke with in the last two months. But because the bill has evolved, we wanted to, uh, on our, from our due diligence side, check back in with folks again um, to get responses to the bill as voted out of finance. Um, so with that, I'm going to be asking people to uh, be brief, roughly five minutes or so. Um, most people are, that will work out. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to really ask uh, everyone the same questions. Um, you can add other things in, but the two basic questions are, what are the financial and engineering implications of <coughs> proposals in S267 as amended down the hall, particularly in terms of implementing Tier 1 and Tier 2? So I think you know, because we're talking about regulated monopolies and any kind of price uh, implications that flow out of the bill, where they will flow through to your rate payers. So from a so we share a responsibility point of view. We want to make sure we know what would happen. So we're going to have one morning to discuss a bill that could cost many tens of millions of dollars to ratepayers in this committee? I think we're going to have enough time. We'll see. If we don't, we'll check back in. Interesting. Yeah. <coughs> um, we did ask for the bill about a month ago. Yeah. And so given that's the way things happen sometimes in the state, so I'd like to jump right in and invite Mr. Kessinger to join us at the table. Yep. Thank you. I have a couple slides. And those are jumping into questions. Sure. Uh, around. Sorry, Sorry, I didn't get that. I want to One. Okay. Yeah. He's sick, right? Uh, yes. Senator, yeah, right, yeah. Thank you. Senator McDonald was sick. He won't be joining us. Uh, another one taken down by Thank you. I think we got it. Okay. Thank you, committee chairman. My name is Josh Castigay with Fremont Power, um, Vice President, Chief Innovation Officer at GMP. We're City Engineering, uh, Power Supply Function, and Innovation Work at GMP. So I'll quickly step through this, and then we can jump right into the questions. But basically, apologies for the formatting. It's in kind of a flip chart mode here. Um, so again, I think folks know, in terms of the 100%, we've committed to 100% by 2030. That component of the, the bill, the tier one, um, is GP supports that, fully supports that. It's been our plan to move in that direction. Tier two, so as we've talked about, Supportive of doubling tier two, supportive of doubling new renewable energy um, in a way that the original intent of tier two, there's some language in here, but basically it was around limiting cost impact for electric customers, supporting reliability, contributing to avoiding or deferring improvements on the TMD system, and also diversifying the size and types of resources. So, figuring out a way to, to get back to that, that form of thinking, we put some ideas out there but basically how to diversify. Um, and we'll talk about solar in just a second, but how to diversify the types of technologies, the new renewable energy, and do it in a way that doesn't um, have significant impacts of the transmission distribution system, which we'll talk about as well. Jumping forward, so as tier two has been, been laid out, even though tier two hasn't been a, never dictated it was, it was solar only, that's, just, that's how it's worked. And that's great, it's been fine. It, you know, solar, as it started, had a tremendous impact on the peaks in Vermont. Those have now shifted to later in the day and at night. Um, and so the, the value has been changing. We still think, and we'll show here in a second, that solar, you know, in the first 10% of tier two, there's still a lot of solar to go, to be needed there. Um, you know, as we look on to page four and five, these are, this is GMP's data, which again, we, represent roughly just shy of 80% of, of the state of Vermont, customers in Vermont. So we, we show here both installations of solar and applications of solar um, to just show both. So you can see in 2019 how many 
megawatts of solar was installed on our, across our system. This is both net metering as well as the non-net metering solar, which could be standard off for the larger projects. And second, we look at actual applications. So in 2019, we had uh, more applications for, for megawatts of solar than we did in 2018. And just another point to, to make, the 2020 is starting out pretty strong as well. So the first two months of 2020 applications are, are quite a bit higher than the first two months were of 2019. So again, just, just to, from our point of view, in terms of solar continuing to be strong in Vermont. We, and those are net metering apps? That's everything. That's so everything. if you look at, on the applications page, the, the first three colors, the blue, the orange, gray, on the bar chart mm -hmm. is all the net metering. Mm -hmm. And then the yellow is, it can be a standard offer project, other types of projects. So the chart on six just shows our tier two obligation. The green is the current 10% obligation. So as of 2019, we're at about 2.2% of the total obligation for, for meeting tier two. So there's still a considerable amount of, of solar that's gotta be built to meet tier two. Or other resources, again, it's, it's predominantly solar and probably will continue to be. For GMP, it's about another, it's over 250 megawatts of additional solar just in the 10% that exists today. The blue is just showing you like doubling tier two and how much more energy we'll need to achieve there. So when we think about it, the big piece is, is how to do it in a way that diversifies the resource that benefits from a grid perspective, from a cost perspective, from a carbon perspective. You get, you know, the winter time is a, is a heavy carbon intense time of year. Um, and so having resources that can meet those times is, is important as well. When we break down the cost, we look at it in sort of two buckets. We have what is, you know, if tier two just doubled as is, what would um, it cost GMP in a range to fulfill it as, as we do today? And, and it's, it's essentially 15, if you, if you jump ahead, you get to the point where, okay, we've met the tier two, double tier two. It's an additional 15 to 25 million in that year. So over 10 years, it's 150 to 250 million. And that range is basically, um, and, and this is before, I'll get into the transmission upgrades, this is before any transmission upgrades. And that range is basically on the high end, that would be if you met a lot of it with net metering. The lower end is if it's less net metering maybe and more larger, you know, two or five megawatt projects. So that's, that's sort of the range there. So the transmission is the other aspect. If, if it were per the Velco long range plan, if it were built out across the state as it has been uh, currently going, you'd have anywhere from 150 to 500 million dollars of transmission investments or upgrades. That reflects through to GMP and to the other DUs because that would all be borne by the state of Vermont, Vermont customers in one form or another. So for GMP, that results in an additional, it, it ends up being about 10% of the investment to figure if you spend $150 million on a transmission upgrade, um, it's gonna cost GMP customers an extra 15 million a year or 150 million over 10 years um, up to, you know, obviously 500 million is gonna be much higher. So, that's just, that's just highlighting the two buckets. You would actually add those together. So there'd be the additional cost of procuring the, the renewables and the additional cost of the transmission system added together. It's a big range because it, there's, there's a lot of unknowns, location, all of those things are, are really important. But um, the, the last point I'll make is just, just doubling tier two as it is today, like you're talking about you know in excess of 1200 megawatts of solar in Vermont where um, the system peak is 900. GMP's daily average load you can figure is around 450. So it's a considerable amount of just one resource, which is some of the things that drive transmission upgrade needs and that sort of thing. So could you explain the last bullet there? It says, for example, estimated 400 million due to net metering over the next 10 years. What do you mean there? Yeah. So what we're saying there is that there's there there are other costs that exist today. And net metering is one of them. So, this, so that that is sort of like that's happening. 
So that is that's easy. the total cost of net metering or the cost shift to other rate payers? Just the cost shift. So it's the right. probably above market yep. component. Above market. Yep. <clears throat> These are all um, the above the 150 to 250. That's the above market. That's the actual what, what customers would and have. That's just for your customers. That's correct. That's correct. Um, so am I reading right that it, on an end basis, it's 15 to 25 plus one tenth of that 150 to 500. So you're, uh, on the low end, it's 15 plus uh, 15 plus 15, so 30. And, and then how does 30 million in um, increased costs flow through to someone's electric bill? I don't know if we're, how many millions equals on the rate or percent on the rate. Yeah. So for for rate increases for GMP, it's roughly six million dollars is a is a percent of rate increase. The thing to keep in mind is that once you have a a, a one percent rate increase, that's now locked in, and that's why we talk about it in terms of multiple years because there's this notion that oh it's only a one or two percent rate increase. That's not that bad, but actually that's now you've bumped up and that's permanent unless something else changes or you've got other drivers obviously, but um, so for GMP that's that's about the about the ballpark and then that becomes baked into your cost. So and if I'm using the low end on both those figures, fifteen and fifteen, thirty at six million each, that's a five percent rate increase for a year. It, yeah, that's about it. expect that would happen 10 years in a row? Well, it would be more than 10 years. Essentially what happens is once you increase rates, right. unless something else changes, it's it's indefinite. Right. Now, no, but I mean like five the first year and another five and another five, that's what I meant by it. It's more, it, so it depends on what happens after this, but if you just, let's just say you meet double tier two and you stop, <coughs> there's no new renewables or anything, it would stay there, so you would add 30 to whatever the other end of the range is in that year, and you'd continue to pay that every year. You wouldn't then keep stacking on it unless other things were happening. You know, there's like you're going to 30% or something else. But it's it's 30 million more customers are paying each year than they would have paid before. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, any, any questions? Oh, excuse me. Thanks for jumping right in. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite next to yes, we'll uh, join us, um, Ms. Cohen. Uh, if, with your permission, Craig Keeney was able to join us today, and he's our expert on this, so if he does most of the talking, um, I think we'll get a lot out of that. And um, Lisa Morris is here with us as well, in case we need her to jump in. So okay. the experts are here today. All right, thank you. Uh, and I don't know if he's a person, but I'll answer the question. We're basically looking at what are the financial engineering obligations? Right. Too much is final. And who is the previous customer? Okay. Do you want me to pass this up? Okay. Yeah. This is the testimony from last time we were here. Did you have both of them? Yeah, everything's in that packet. Oh. And that also includes the letter we had sent to finance, which I don't think you saw, which was okay. kind of okay. high level. So we have two things. One is a letter. That Andrea sent the other of my testimony from last time. And, uh, and I apologize that we're going to ask people to do it in brief, but yeah, point where to what? Doing a high speed Be tour brief. back with each utility to say, okay. yeah, he's going to be. I will be brief. changed since the first time. <laughs> I'll get the highlights. Yeah, you do. So, again, my name is Craig Keeney from our like co op manager of House Spot. Thank you um, for having me here today. As you recall, I was here earlier, and um, our position has not changed, even with the rewrite of the bill. The numbers that I presented for last time are still the same. And our concern is the rising cost, because we have many members who we serve for a long time. So we're still in that position. With respect to specific wording in the bill, you turn to page three of the bill, there's a section C2 which talks about storage. Um, and I'll read the sentence to you, starting on line 17. 
This distributed renewable generation shall use technologies, including storage, to maximize grid resilience and should be located in a manner, manner that maximizes grid efficiency. Our concern with that wording is that it's ambiguous. Does he have a different copy than we do? Um, we have as sorted out. Give it us says uh, number seven at the top. Oh yeah, we might have draft number seven. Yeah, you don't have the one that has staff is. Yeah, I don't think that's seven. That's not, but it's a time stamp. I mean, it's just time stamp. It is three nine twenty at twelve thirty one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you read it correctly. You yeah, read it page three or seven. The bottom here, line 17. Okay, our numbers. It's yeah, just the numbers are different. Oh, okay, so starting oh, yeah. on line 15. Yep. You, on page three. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. <clears throat> That's all right. So the um, our concern with that ambigu ambiguity is, what are we talking about storage here? Is this storage that is paired? With a renewable project, is it just storage that can be filled from the grid? Is it storage that is owned by and paid for just by the end use customer, or is it storage that is subsidized by other members and other utility customers? The concern there is that if, although storage has many benefits, if it's used at the wrong time, it can actually increase cost to the utility. And if it's Storage that's subsidized by all the members, we, we have a concern with that because it can drive up cost. So we'd like that ambiguity cleared up. Turning to page seven, section two, interconnection maps. Oh, page five of section two. Section two, the interconnection maps. Mm -hmm. Got it. We appreciate the intent of that wording that tries to steer <coughs> uh, development to places that are not congested, but as worded, it has no teeth. It is just a suggestion. There's nothing that makes the developer not be able to build an area that's already congested. We that clear. And not in here, but something that we did suggest to Senate Finance, and I think we talked about in our letter, is minimizing or lowering the threshold for net metering from 500 kilowatt to 150 kW. And we think that that will, the purpose of that is net metering is the most expensive way for us to meet the rest. And our goal is to meet the rest in the least possible. We understand that some people would argue that the 500 kW projects allow uh, people who can't put solar on their roof to participate. But what we're seeing is that in, a, in the 500 kW projects that we have, the number of customers that are buying from those averages approximately two. And when I say approximately, I'm rounding up. Can you, uh, sorry, I couldn't quite hear the first half of what you said. When you, I didn't hear the, the last sentence. If you look at our 500, the 500 KW project in our service territory, okay. yep. the, the average number of customers buying from those is two. Oh, two. Okay. So not serving that purpose. Not, not necessarily uh, serving household mm -hmm. as a, right. a way that for households access. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did you. Have you looked at the um, bill as currently written um, from finance and done the math on what it will mean to your rate payers? They have a sense of high or low, what, it will, what the impact would be? Yeah, the wording in this bill does not change the analysis that I did when I came here and spoke earlier. Okay. So, so that's in your packet. Yeah, in the packet. <laughs> And uh, we're looking at a rate increase from between 4% and 11% by 2032. So it will gradually get to that. We're not talking 4% every year. Right. So it'll gradually get there and then stop. But by 2032. Yes. Okay. 
So it's so important to talk about other factors. Look at well, this away. On top of other factors. Well, in addition no, to, no, no. I mean, that's right. one of the things that we talked about in finance. It's, it's on top <clears> of <throat> already meeting the current <clears throat> This is in addition to the impact from the current rate. And along with any other market fluctuations yeah. or. And I, I was in finance and Craig wasn't, so the conversation there, I think, just want to be clear, the cost impacts are going to come every year. And you can see on his chart, he breaks it down year by year. We don't go for a rate increase every year. So we would try to absorb those costs or, you know, do different things, but eventually it's going to catch up and we'll have to do a rate increase. Unless we can mitigate in other ways, but we've kind of pulled all those rabbits out of the hat already. And... Um, do you know what this trans, you know, four to eleven percent rate? So by 2032, are you saying year one you might have a four year, a four percent bump, and then it would ramp until over that period of time you would have seen eleven percent increase in rates attributable to just this um, new requirement? No, four percent is if I use the low end of meeting our red, which is nine cents per kilowatt hour for a solar project, <laughs> and there's no transmission upgrades required. The high end is 11%, and that's if we use net metering and there are transmission upgrades required, which Velco talked about okay. earlier. So, did that answer your question? Yes, and mm -hmm. um, do you have you know, I'm just trying to get it that in my head down. What does it mean to somebody's bill? So if we pick a figure in the middle, an eight percent increase. Uh, is, is, I don't know if an average bill is uh, eighty dollars in your region, hundred dollars in your region. So yeah, it's probably it. it's in the ballpark of twelve dollars a month. Twelve dollars. Yeah. I, I don't know the exact average bill, but at, at six hundred kilowatt hours a month, it's probably in the neighborhood of twelve dollars. So an increase? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, any any questions? Thank you for Thank you. jumping in. I know it's very good cool rest, but perfect. Um, next invite up uh, Ms. Bailey. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Melissa Bailey with Vermont Public Power Supply Authority, um, Manager of Government and Member Relations. And she you know, previously testified to this committee on um, S-267, there have been changes, so I plan to focus my testimony on um, the new language. Uh, as a reminder to the committee, that's <laughs> represents 11 municipal electric utilities in Vermont that all operate on a nonprofit basis. All of the costs our members incur are passed directly on to ratepayers, and any value we are able to generate is also passed on to our community member and customers. Uh, so, Sorry, am I controlling? Yes. Um, so, VEPSA's position on S267, we're supportive of the Tier 1 requirement. As a reminder, we spent a good deal of time in this committee discussing um, efficiency Vermont potential to spend $6 million over several years on climate, um, on combating greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. This bill imposes costs that are magnitudes larger than that. Um, and so we do have significant concerns about the magnitude of costs when they're, uh, it's, this seems to be um, setting the state on one path um, for achieving some climate benefit, and it's an extremely expensive path. So again, as a reminder, the electric sector is extremely low in carbon emissions already. So if we're looking at um, getting the most bang for our buck, uh, EPSA supports other potential methods, such as increasing funding for weatherization and other sectors of the, um, the energy economy. There has been a good deal of testimony on um, supporting jobs, and, and again, we think that's an important goal, but again, um, in, in making policy, we think that other um, alternatives should be on the table and should be explored. So moving on to um, our primary concern with the bill as drafted, as passed out of finance, is this tier two dot little two. Um, 
the sto solar and storage mandate as drafted. The bill says that um, distributed generation shall use technologies including storage. We read that as a definitive um, requirement for utilities to not only deploy, um, not only double the tier two requirement, which has effectively been solar, uh, but also attach it to storage. Um, utilities are already deploying storage and are already considering um, how to best site storage and best size storage to maximize grid benefits. Um, the BEPS members are considering deploying large scale storage at, at the substation level. We see that as more cost effective and more beneficial to the grid than individual storage um, in, in residential units. Um, and so we're concerned about this. Um, this mandate that would essentially dictate where the storage could be located as well as um, effectively dictate the size because if you're, um, there's a cap on the project size for tier two resources which is five megawatts so the storage accompanying that would most likely be smaller. And again, we do have the same concerns that Mr. Keeney highlighted around this language about maximizing resilience um, and ma maximizing grid res resilience that um, seems a little bit nebulous and be concerned about who makes that determination. I think I mentioned the, the bill implies that um, storage smaller than five megawatts is more effective, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, also, uh, um, requiring that storage be sited adjacent to generation does not necessarily result in the best um, grid location. There are areas of the grid um, that can accommodate more generation, even absent storage. We have areas of the distribution grid that have capacity and we could add um, additional storage. And there's not essentially a need for, um, for storage at those locations. There are other constrained areas that could use storage, um, even absent the addition of generation. So we don't see a natural coupling between those two necessarily um, for grid benefit. Just another note that storage is already included as a tier three measure under the renewable energy standard, so we do have some concerns about the duplication or overlap there. I'm not sure whether utilities would be essentially claiming tier two and tier three credit for the same measures. And with um, the expansion of the tier two mandate as written, even absent storage, um, siting these projects has become increasingly difficult. That's is in the process of deploying about 10 megawatts of solar, finding locations that um, pass muster with the Agency of Natural Resources where permitting is possible has become increasingly difficult. We're seeing projects um, commissioned through the standard offer program taking three years to commission to come online. So we do have concern about even though the effective date, I think, of that, um, the tier two expansion was 2023, we still think, and that's several years out, we still think there could be um, some issues with timing and getting projects online and getting generation in time. Uh, the Chair's question, the power supply costs that VEPSA would expect from doubling the Tier 2 requirement are in the range of 7 to 12 million, and this is excluding our share of any Velco grid-related costs, which I believe GMP um, made reference to, and you may hear more from Velco on those, but any of those costs that um, got passed on, would get passed on to the VEPSA members are not included in this estimate. And this does not include the storage requirement, which I think that language changed just a couple of days ago. The um, transmission portion from VELCO, uh, is that <coughs> prorated by percent of load within the state, utility by utility? Yes, that's exactly right. I think they have a few different allocations, but that's roughly correct. And VEPSA is about six to seven percent of the state's load. Some of those costs, I think, are peak-related versus um, energy-related, but yes, roughly proportional. Okay. And I do just want to mention that um, the costs and grid impacts for FEPSA members would be partially mitigated by um, the hydro provision in the bill, which would allow um, existing hydro facilities that are smaller than five megawatts that have acquired a new um, water quality certificate from the state to be eligible as tier two resources. Um, we're supportive of that provision. Uh, we su suggested that provision. And just as a reminder, um, existing hydro is an extremely important resource for the VEPSA members. Um, we want to see those hydros remain financially viable moving forward. And how do, the, how do those work with the RECs? Are those the higher value RECs, your little 
high gross. So currently those are low value recs, those would just be tier one, and what this bill would do is make them eligible for tier two okay. once they had gotten, once they'd met the, essentially the modern water quality standards. So that is a big differential um, between, you know, tier one recs are low, low. maybe a dollar. And, yep. um, so a like dollar versus dollar. several. 60. Currently 30 or 30. For tier two, I think um, the big expanded tier two requirement, we will see cost pressure on those. Um, mm -hmm. The ACP is sixty-one dollars wow. for tier two. So um, essentially, we think the effect of this new requirement will be pushing costs up against the ACP, which is the maximum. As written, that's what the bill would. Um, I have a quick question on one of your earlier um, slides or something. In terms of what this will do to rates, were you saying that if you were mentioning that energy efficiency modernization which we were doing in here earlier this session? Mm -hmm. So at least uh, because that's let's try trying to make it possible to fuel switch basically, mm -hmm. if that fuel switching becomes less and less uh, financially viable, the higher the electric rates go. So are you saying that we're working across mm -hmm. purposes to that? Proposal. Yes, we're looking at essentially cost in the electric sector. This would be a big cost driver. We're thinking four to five percent again, based on the seven to twelve million estimate that didn't include grid costs. So that's on the low end, um, four to five percent <coughs> increase in rates over the um, over the requirement period. And yes, we think that increasing cost pressure in the electric sector undermines electrification efforts, and it's a cumulative effect. In all of this, may I just ask, Mr. Chair, I, I mean, because I'm going, I just asked finance to bring me my notes. Some of these, I mean, you're talking about rate increases, but budgetary shifts could be made in other areas as well. Isn't that accurate? I mean, you could make other changes that would lessen a rate increase or maybe not even cause an increase. I'm not sure what those changes would be unless you're talking about operational efficiencies. I mean, we're running I, I don't know. Well. I mean, I'm looking at things for some folks, salaries, those kinds of things, salary increases, that sort of thing. I mean, I'm just, again, I'm just going through these notes, and I want to well, start doing that as a state. We can ask other people to do that, but until we well, do it, we're not asking, but we always deal, any company is going to be sure, doing that. I would say, people say, people um, right. I, mean, I, I would say that the so municipals are on a pretty, pretty, um, low salaries and there was not a lot of skin there. I don't right. know how familiar you all are with local government, but I'd say those salaries are fairly low. And, and then and again, also, if I may, yeah. a second, also, again, just going through some of these notes, tell me a little bit about whether or not you think this would make for a stronger, more resilient grid, this bill. I mean, that's another reason that I think we really, yeah. you know, the committee yeah. really felt like this was a good direction. Yeah. We have, um, I think the short answer, no. I think that you the level of, of prescriptiveness that's embedded in the bill really actually hinders the utility's ability to build resilience um, by having the flexibility, as I said, to site storage where it's needed, mm -hmm. not where solar developers decide to put a solar project. So unfortunately, I, I would fully sympathize with the desire to have a more resilient grid, and um, our utility members have every interest in doing that. Um, they want to serve the customers in the best possible way, but the level of um, you know, I'm not going to I'm just kind of going through these notes. I want to make sure we can kind of have this full conversation that everybody hears sort of stuff that we also talked about in fine. Sure. So. Yeah, we fully support deploying storage. I think it has a key um, role in, in improving the resilience of the system. But we, I, we feel as though this would tie our hands in how it gets done. Uh, the resilience is get yourself a generator. Then you don't have to worry about when the power goes out. It's, let's have a good conversation, smart conversations. <laughs> it is a smart conversation. But there are here. But there are also the uh, all not everybody can use that. Yeah. But I think so what Ms. Bailey, let's have well, that's what I'm getting at. I think what Ms. Bailey is pointing out, Bailey's Bailey's pointing out that by the company. cost estimates that all the utilities and the department are putting out there in the Tens of millions, possibly hundreds of millions statewide, if we implemented some other tax or fee on Vermonters, invested that same money in thermal efficiency, that we would dramatically improve how we are addressing carbon emissions. They're already low carbon. We're going to add millions of dollars to ratepayers for not that much 
benefit if we're chasing carbon. Especially at a time when more people are willing to switch to electric vehicles and just increase mm -hmm. the cost of electric vehicles mm -hmm. by increasing the electric bill. Am I, is that close? I mean, when you say the, this isn't the best way to address carbon, attacking the electric rate payer. Yes, I would agree with that. And I think that that's is or position on this point, that we should be looking at the most, most cost-effective alternatives and deploying, if we're talking about expending millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, we should make sure we're doing so effectively. And I would just close by saying um, we have concerns about the process. I think a previous version of this bill included a comprehensive study that could be completed over the coming months prior to the next legislative session, and we would fully support that. We can get some of these um, cost and benefit estimates. There could be greater transparency um, around the financial implications and um, so we would be supportive of that process before making such a sweeping change. Yeah. On the movement from zero to uh, two to 12 on the tier two points, uh, where, where are your members? I mean, I, I'm part of the, behind my question is, is there urgency? Like, where are we on that sort of timeline? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say there's not, Urgency, I, I believe most of the utilities, I know the BEPSA members are in the process of deploying 10 megawatts of solar. One of those projects has come online and the other two are expected for the fall. And essentially, in order to achieve economies of scale, um, utilities built projects that would satisfy the need, right? We didn't build for the 1% requirement in the first year. We built for the projected 10% requirement in the out year, which has resulted in a small excess of generation in the early years of res compliance. And then there will be a gap, at least for VEPSA, um, coming in the late 2020s that we will not have completely satisfied our needs. So in terms of urgency, no, we feel as though we have enough projects in the pipeline to meet the current um, res requirement. Obviously, net metering is a big variable there. And I would say that the outcome of this bill, as drafted, would result if the, if the hydro provision remains intact and the um, storage plus solar mandate is um, included, essentially, if all new tier two resources need to be accompanied by solar, the result for the VEPSA systems would be selling the RECs from the solar projects that we already have deployed because they don't have storage with them, and then starting again from scratch, building projects with storage. So the benefit, the environmental attributes of the existing projects that we just spent the past three to four years building would be exported, and we would start again deploying projects that came with storage. Any other questions? Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to next invite up uh, Mr. McNamara. I don't know where we're going. I'll take that seat. Is this a twister? Twisters are taken by the musical chair. That's what we want to do. What? I'm not getting off the ration. Right. Is that a world of two amendments? We're just told writers to get into the show. That's fine. Good morning, Mr. McNamara. Good morning, Mr. McNamara. Good morning, Mr. McNamara. Double time. Yep, I'll be quick. Um, Ed McNamara, Director of Planning for Department of Public Service. Uh, quick overview. Department strongly supports 100% renewable energy standard, including a requirement for new generation. Uh, we think it can be done in a way that actually promotes public policy. Um, policy should be informed by analysis, pretty much the opposite of what's happening with this bill. It's changing pretty much nonstop. There's been no actual cost analysis except for things that have been done on the fly. And additionally, um, ratepayer costs should further climate goals rather than benefit for-profit corporations. The way that this 100% um, res is designed essentially takes what you've heard is tens to hundreds of millions of dollars from ratepayers, gives it to solar developers with minimal benefit for the public. So 100% renewable energy standard. Uh, lots of different ways to achieve this. Uh, other states have done 100%. It's definitely possible. Things that you need to look at, existing versus new, basically tier one versus tier two, regional versus in-state. And noting that the cost of design options can vary significantly. There's a little bit about the cost of getting up to 1,200 megawatts of solar in Vermont. So far, what we've heard um, 
every version of this bill, the tier two requirement doesn't really increase for a couple of years, so it's actually plenty of time to study. There just appears to not be a desire to actually understand the costs. And from the department's view, it's better to make an informed decision first instead of hoping that someone else fixes problems later down the road. So the department proposal that we put forward in the Senate Finance would commit to 100% renewable energy standard and allow time for an actual informed decision. Uh, the department would conduct a study, look at design options, and provide a report on costs and benefits by December 1st, 2020. It's actually a pretty heavy lift, but we can commit to doing that. We think it's important for the public, for ratepayers, to understand what the costs are. That would allow time for the development of a bill and thoughtful consideration and discussion. Also, it would allow the legislature to be transparent about the costs they are imposing on electric companies. <coughs> so what we would consider studying, or what we would propose to study, uh, costs and benefits of alternative design options, again, existing versus new, regional versus in-state. Um, also try to understand, there's been a lot of discussion about in-state generation provides all these benefits, and try <coughs> to understand that. Uh, Vermont does not make solar panels or inverters, which is a significant portion of the capital cost of any solar project. So that's money automatically going out of state. Um, obviously, there's tax benefits and other benefits of in-state generation, but try to actually quantify what those are. Also understand that there's a connection between electric rates and electrification. The electric sector accounts for roughly 2% in 2018 of carbon emissions. So thermal and transportation is over three quarters of the carbon emissions. We need to electrify, we need to do electric vehicles, we need to do heat pumps. If you increase rates by 5% every year for years, you're not gonna do that. It's pretty simple. Some customers will choose to electrify uh, based on climate concerns, most people cannot afford that. And we're going to have to actually look at the cost effect. <laughs> it's also important to understand, too, the connections. We've heard about the connections between net metering and tier two, the standard offer programs, actually how everything in Philly's would look at that. And something else that hasn't come up yet is there's three utilities, Burlington Electric, Washington Electric, <clears throat> and Swanton, that are currently exempt because they're 100% renewable, so they do not bear any of these tier two costs that we've been talking about. Going forward, we should look at if all utilities are gonna be 100% renewable, should that exemption remain? So, impact of doubling down on solar. When you do a carve out for a specific resource type, it's basically saying the resource can't compete on its own and saying to ratepayers, you're going to bear the risks of those competition instead of the for-profit entities. So that's essentially what we're doing here. here. Um, you've heard a lot about the significant costs associated with power supply and transmission and distribution costs. And as a put in, um, also, Ms. Bailey mentioned the storage requirement. In the department's view, that's essentially acknowledging that you're mandating a problem and then mandating further costs to then fix the problem by requiring storage. Uh, these, can I just pause you? Yep. Mandating the problem. Or does that mean that they're um, sure. sort of transient overproduction, so you're going to store? Exactly that to accommodate that much storage up on the grid, you can either completely overfill the grid for that for those hours of the year, or you can install storage. So power supply costs, um, Mr. Kassengay touched on this a little bit, and Ms. Bailey as well. Once you actually have, state policy is basically mandated kingdom, community, wind, um, long-term contracts with a lot of renewable resources. What happens when these utilities have to take all the solar, they have to sell that power because they have to take the solar. So they're selling all that other renewable power and they're selling it at a time when the wholesale market is the lowest. And then when solar is not producing in the winter, they're buying the highest time. So you're basically telling utilities, sell low, buy high. Um, also net metering. Net metering is a component of this. Uh, the PUC, in looking at net metering rates, has said net metering is a component of Tier 2. So if you double Tier 2, you're essentially sending the signal to the PUC, increase the amount of net metering. In 2018, this is just GMP alone, 
the above market cost, and this is above market for new renewable, was $35 million. Just three net meter. That's one year. That's just the cost shift. That's, that's the cost shift. Just the additional unnecessary costs borne by rate payers. Yep. Yes. Transmission costs, you've gone through a lot of this. Belco gave an estimate of $900 million for battery costs, transmission costs up to half a billion dollars. And at least Velka was saying that you can have the minimal, the only $150 million in transmission costs if you cite appropriately. But the bill, as it is now, does not provide the PUC with any tools. So if you look this, I swiped this from the Velka's long range transmission plan and the presentation they gave, I believe, here a couple weeks ago. This is showing the red areas, northern Vermont, basically don't put any more solar there. If you're serious about um, well-sited solar, then you need to give the PUC tools, including saying, don't put any more net metering in Northern Vermont. Mm -hmm. So, somebody's been saying that for several years now. <coughs> I, I, so, <laughs> there's a question about um, about resilience, and this bill does not actually do anything for resilience. So generation homogen, I should have actually made sure I could pronounce it if I was going to get this line, homogeneity, thank you. Um, basically, by mandating a monocrop of solar all over the place, you're actually reducing resilience. If you think of, um, my background was actually ecology before I started doing energy. So what you learn is the larger an area, a natural area, the more diverse, the more species within that area, the more diverse, or sorry, the more resilient that area is. If you basically have a backyard with an apple tree and a rose bush next to it, it's not particularly diverse. So by saying, let's just have lots of solar and storage, you're not actually increasing any diversity. There is resilience for the people who can afford to put in the Tesla power walls. And if you actually do have a well-planned microgrid, well-planned being you look at what's a warming area in northern Vermont, so if power goes out in the wintertime, people can stay warm. Mm -hmm. You look at emergency services, making sure that when we have electric ambulances, they can actually charge. You identify specifically where these microgrids and where the resilient storage needs to be. I guess my point in that was a little bit, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, Power is going out of the out of the state. Like we're getting from other areas. And isn't it isn't it in a way more resilient to sort of keep it here, dollars here, that kind of thing, economic resilience, and also, you know, keeping sort of our energy and power local. Um, so that's what I was kind of you know. So you're not about. talking about technical resilience. Well, also technical resilience, or so, or at least I mean <clears throat> so. One of the things we were talking about in finance is, you know, again, how can we keep stuff? You would think that if it's local, it's going to be more resilient. We're going to be able to fix it. We're going to be able to deal with it. If it's you're sort of losing something, if we're relying on another state or another country for it, that's kind of what I was getting at. <clears throat> sorry, I was just not expecting the those kind of. Anyway, sorry. Um, no, I don't understand your. I, I don't understand the, the look or the. Yeah, help, I'll, help me out. I'll, I'll talk offline on that. Okay. Um, so first, vast majority of outages are actually on the distribution circuit. Yeah. On the the, the transmission level. Yeah. There's NERC reliability, federal reliability standards. So if yeah. you look when you're driving down the road, when you see a Belco right away. Yeah. 150 feet of clearing on either, or 150 feet of clearing around those lines when you drive down the road. There's barely anything. I mean, that's a policy choice. You don't want to have massive tree clearing costs, and people don't want to lose all the trees in their front yard. So also, because of federal reliability standards, you've got massive redundancy in the generation and transmission system operational level. Yep. So you're actually relying on the regional <coughs> level, which we've done for decades, does not. Um, is not less resilient than trying to produce everything through one resource and storage in the state. Um, so the most recent bill sort of seizes on an existing ratepayer like safety valve, I think is what it's called. And basically what that says is once you get to the maximum possible cost of um, 
renewable energy standard, then you can actually look at potential ways to mitigate those costs. It's also a little bit confusing because the way the bill is written, it has two tier twos with two different safety valves, and it's not entirely clear when a project is under which one. So that creates, I think, some confusion, for, at least from a regulatory perspective. The safety uh, valve being the ACP? The <laughs> safety or? valve is essentially if you reach the ACP and the costs are um, greater than the PERPA costs, then you can potentially, you can petition the PUC and say for the next year, um, let me instead get <coughs> generation from, and this part gets really, I, today I have not yet understood how this actually works, and it's a little concerning because I'm not the brightest, but I can usually get what's in the bills, and I don't understand how this works. It looks like it's actually saying, if you get to um, the maximum cost in terms of the ACP and alternative cost for building basically a solar project, then you can um, instead get the power from a larger in-state, and if that's still too expensive, from a larger regional. At least that's how it was described in Senate Finance. I don't read it that way in the bill. And the, the fact that the bill is the only safety valve for costs is extremely unclear. <coughs> Overall, it seems to be that the, um, the expectations. Okay. Well, just before we go on, it says rate payer <laughs> protection at the very top, and, and, and that always gives me a concern. We've not really heard from any low income advocate or anybody that the, the, the proposed rates are going to affect. It, is it my understanding that the department is actually the only real defender of? ratepayers in the state right now we have no ratepayer advocate but that's part of the department's the department's role is both planning which is my function and ratepayer advocate um, so we're housed within the same agency we do represent um, and to be clear when we represent ratepayer interests we're not saying lowest possible cost no matter what we're yeah. saying lowest cost to meet the goals set by the legislature. In this case, that includes climate goals, carbon reduction goals, renewable goals. We want to do that. We want to meet it at a lower cost than this bill provides. Um, also, I should note that um, every utility has come here and argued for the, against this bill. And the way that the law is structured is utilities are allowed to simply pass through the renewable energy standard costs. Mm -hmm. So they're held harmless by this. So they're actually coming in here. They're not personally affected by this. Their ratepayers are affected. So they're coming in, in this case, to represent their ratepayers. Is the bill consistent with the uh, 218C cost integrated resource plan? Not at all. Not in the least. <coughs> um, so overall, it seems the way the bill is structured now is an expectation that if there are significant costs uh, and some problems, they can be fixed after the fact. And instead of actually coming up with an informed and thoughtful decision with full information as to the costs and benefits, it's instead pushing something through, hoping that a future legislature fixes any problems. And the final question is, once you actually put a subsidy in place, how often does it get withdrawn? So that's the department's concern about pushing something forward now and then hoping that maybe we can fix it later. I sort of have a, a case of that going on right now in parallel with all this, uh, the right hand question. Well, and, and I've asked, just so the committee knows, I've asked Ed if he and the department could put us together a list of power producers and the cost because you get it you know senator mcdonald has continued to rail on the rygate power plant which is by far not the most expensive power or the most heavily subsidized power in the state and provides multiple other benefits that other power producers don't in that produces a market for low rate wood but I, I think Senator McDonald has continued to mislead people about how expensive and subsidized the Rygate power plant is. So I'd like this committee to actually understand it. Okay. Um, it's not a tag member, so they're not here. 
I would do it if he was there I know as well. Let's wait. So I'm also, sorry, I ever mentioned the, the R word. Uh, right, so let's move on. Um, <laughs> any other questions for Mr. Mack? Thank you, Ed. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, let's invite up Ms. Campbell. Uh, Campbell. Okay, Hansen. did you get the skate? I can't climb over everything. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and you know, I've been saying to folks, uh, if you come with someone and you want to have do sort of tag team wrestling and more than one protector, that's always up to you. Excuse me. Well, this is moving and I'm not touching that. You see that? Is there a mouse? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Over here. <laughs> I, was I was trying to open to forget that. Computers in the future will drive themselves. Um, just, you're, you don't have a problem. So just no, what I think here. helpful is I did send you one chart that said current power. Um, let's see. Is it the store? Electricity by type. Is that it? Yep. Nice job, Jude. Fabulous. Can I just yeah. also say, Jude's doing incredible job, Yeoman's job, with all this getting thrown at her. So thank you so much. Um, for the record, my name's Olivia Campbell Anderson. I'm Executive Director of Renewable Energy Vermont. Um, first, I want to share with you um, a business letter of support um, from more than 170 businesses across the state um, supporting this legislation and increase local renewable electricity and increase resilience. Um, I want to talk about the cost from having a non-resilient grid, um, cost controls in the current law that you all have worked on, um, tools to optimize the grid that are in the bill and important um, language of what the bill actually says. Um, so I here is a here is a fact sheet about the bill. Um, uh, and as I let's see um, a, a couple of uh, uh, Synapse Economics, I think many people in this committee are very familiar with Lisa Hopkins who previously, um, who drafted the comprehensive energy plan that the state has, and previously led planning at the Vermont Department of Public Service. Um, uh, Synapse has done some analysis related to the cost of uh, having a non-resilient grid and what's going on on the system right now. Um, Green Mountain Power customers are paying every single year $25 to $70 um, to just deal with responding to major storms over the last five years. Um, between 2015 and 2019, GMP customers experienced costs of over $300 million due to power outages. Of this, about 50 million of that was due to major storms that we've experienced, and 250 million is due to minor storms. We have a um, as climate change is here, we are already experiencing these impacts with more frequent storms and more intense storms, some of which are sort of even micro episodes of weather, um, which we are thankful that Green Mountain Power has taken significant leadership in trying to move ahead with creating a more resilient grid with local storage on the distribution circuit side. Um, when you put these direct uh, storm costs in um, combination with customer interruptions and how that's affecting local businesses, storms and outages are costing GMP ratepayers $375 million over the last four years for an average of $75 million per year. That's more than 11% of Green Mountain Power's total revenue requirement annually today. Um, it's at least three times as much as the Department of Public Service estimate of the statewide cost of Tier 2. And it's about a quarter of the state's transportation budget, just to put these numbers that you're hearing into some perspective. Um, I will share the details of this analysis. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy um, uh, 
Mr. Hopkins is uh, certainly available given that he crafted the original law um, with you and has done significant analysis to uh, participate by phone. Um, they, I am actually now going to share, doo -doo -doo. this is a fact sheet um, that has information of citing the existing laws that you all have worked so hard on um, uh, to control costs, ensure appropriate utility planning at the least cost integrated plan, and also that the Public Utility Commission currently has at its, its disposal, which it is utilizing to um, maximize um, uh, the grid optimization um, and uh, discourage projects um, in areas uh, where it's not economical to do so, meaning the, you know, there's been a lot of numbers thrown out and a lot of scenarios. There are existing laws on the books, which you have detailed in this fact sheet, that where the PUC actually is using those laws now to, um, to say to projects that are, you know, not, not um, in the ratepayer interest and not in the public benefit because of economics to stop those. And so there are interconnection rules and I just want to be very clear, there's a lot of numbers being thrown out and questions about who pays for what. Every time a new generation project comes onto the grid, the person who is applying for that project pays all of the costs for interconnection. This is current state law. It is a requirement. Can I interrupt you one second? Yes. Ms. Cohen, you're shaking your head. Is that not accurate? Interconnection. Yes. But not all the costs are not even close. So I'm, I'm confused by that, so let me clarify. Okay. Um, so the Public Utility Commission Rule 5.100 governors, governors interconnection to the grid in the state. Um, as you can see, which I have quoted and detailed for you, including with citations in this handout. Um, but Every, what, what's being said isn't that they're not paying. I don't think it's that they're paying for interconnection. Interconnection is a small part of the overall cost. Right. So projects, this rule requires the installer of the projects to pay for all upgrade costs identified by the utilities in the utility studies. Ratepayers do not pay these costs. I would be happy but to But there follow. are still... No, are this is still, the current law. There are still other costs. What are those costs? If, if a solar developer proposes a development and it goes through the PUC and it gets denied, there are still costs incurred by the ratepayers of the state of Vermont. Right, so what I am trying to address is the question related to who pays for grid upgrades uh, for every single generation project in the state. And that is not the ratepayers unless that project is owned by the utility. So the interconnection rule process requires the applicant pay the utility for the utility to study the grid, um, the, the impacts at the distribution <coughs> level and the impacts at the transmission level. Then the utility identifies any necessary <laughs> upgrades, if any, that are required and, and presents as part of that report an estimated cost. At, that, at the time of the process, that sheet goes to the project applicant and it is the responsibility of the project applicant to pay those costs as well as to pay for the cost of the studies should the project go forward. And as part of the CPG process, which is the next phase, all of this is reviewed by the Public Utility Commission. And um, the Public Utility Commission, uh, I've, I've cited here, current law that you have written um, does not allow the PUC to approve a project if it will result in an undue adverse impact to the electric grid. It also requires that any new project be served economically, these are quotes from the existing law that you have written. 
served economically by existing or planned transmission facilities without undue adverse effect on Vermont utilities or customers. So this is the existing law for the processes that every single project in the state is required to go through and who pays for it. Um, so you have these, these are statutory references and I'm sure that the Public Utility Commission could speak to the, the cases, which I know Senator Rogers, you're quite familiar with, um, where they have rejected um, projects and as a result um, in the Shi'ai territory, there have been no projects approved for the last two years. Um, so the, we have a lot of existing controls in the system. There sure are a lot of people around the table shaking their head on some of this well, stuff, so, so we'll, it's very we'll concerning. Check in with the it's very PC concerning. And so uh, these are just facts, and I encourage you to defer to your legislative council regarding what the existing law says. Um, so the it's important, I just want to wrap up here and um, say related to a lot of the testimony that was heard by the Senate Finance Committee um, has, you know, was represented to you again today. Um, there was not a lot of, a change in the bill was related to energy storage. We haven't had time to talk about energy storage in this committee, and I'd be happy to have anyone come and talk with you about that. Here's a fact sheet for you. Um, within, do you want me to pass it? Yeah, this I don't want any more facts at this point. Thank you. Um, Sorry. So, um, uh, related to energy storage, I would, um, you know, I do concur with some of the testimony from Mrs. Bailey at DIPSA um, is that as part of addressing some of these issues about having a more localized and more resilient distribution grid, um, I would recommend that the committee look at the language and change the shall in the storage to a may because um, doing, making that small change in the existing bill um, would address many of the concerns that you have heard around requiring storage with every project. I believe that that was unintentional, um, you know, looking to Senator Campion, but I think that small change could address these concerns. Um, again, it's very important to look at what the language of the bill says versus what many people are testifying is not consistent with what the bill actually says. So if you have any questions, happy to answer those, and also, again, happy for um, Mr. Hopkins to testify and talk with you as well. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I'd like to move on to Mr. Now from the PPC. And um, with me is Elizabeth Schilling, staff sure. attorney with the PUC, and I'm going to let Elizabeth take the oh, you chair. Here. Yeah. Well, you've got that chair. Are you okay if I stay in this chair? Absolutely. Okay. Like a little puzzle of moving one tile at a time. Yeah. 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 Good morning again. Good morning again, uh, Elizabeth for the record. I'm a staff attorney with the Vermont Public Utility Commission. With me this morning is Tom Nauer, policy director. Uh, I'll keep my remarks very brief. Uh, basically, the commission has significant concerns about potential rate impacts requiring utilities to satisfy renewable energy standard with an additional 10% of in-state distributed renewable generation. And it's the commission's belief that uh, the state's renewable energy goals can be met through other less expensive means. Um, looking at the bill itself, uh, the commission just has some concerns about some of the structure and clarity of various provisions in the bill, uh, including the sentence that's been uh, testified to quite a bit already. Uh, I believe it's on page three, I think on line 15 of your version of the bill. Um, and states this distributed renewable generation shall use technologies including storage that maximize grid resilience and shall be located in a manner that maximizes grid efficiency. Um, this provision is in the compliance component of the res. This is not when we're looking at and approving projects at the beginning of the process. Um, so utilities have to comply with this you know, after projects have already been approved. Uh, utilities have to take net metering projects 
this this provision doesn't guarantee that those net metering projects are located in a, an efficient way or that they include battery storage. So I think there's just a concern about where this requirement is placed in the statute. Um, so. Those are, those are my comments, Tom, do you want to add, add to Sure, I, I have a few notes from a, a drafting bill that was given to me mid morning yesterday, so I'm hoping that's the same version that everyone else is working on. Yes. Um, one observation I had was that the timeline for the tier one 100% requirement concludes in 2030, but the DG portions of the bill continue to conclude in 2032. Um, I wasn't sure if that was the intent or whether there just needs to be some consistency <laughs> added to the editing or review of the bill. It might cause some awkward moments for utilities who have to be 100% in 2030, but then continue to add distributed generation in subsequent years. Um, there's a section pertaining to interconnection maps, and I, I will defer to the utilities to, to speak up to, to their concerns, but I just want to make sure that the um, provision of interconnection maps wouldn't require utilities to disclose anything that would be CEII, um, subject to remind me what that means, critical energy infrastructure and information. And then there is also a section 3B that would um, have the PUC uh, conduct a report. Um, I just wanted to note a couple things. First, the interconnection rule is currently being looked at by, by some of our staff, so it's already under review. I don't know if an additional report to the legislature would change the outcome there or whether it would add more information. Um, certainly, you know, Alcar will be seeing that rule at some point. Um, and then the, the other note is um, with respect to how to improve the Section 248 process, um, I don't see how Section 248 is related to helping developers identify locations on the grid that are most beneficial or minimize costs. It would seem to me that the developers would want that information prior to engaging in or, or going down the road of Section 248. So you know, the mention of Section 248 just kind of seems misplaced to me. Uh, certainly, I think probably everyone in the room would like to see generation placed in invested spots. I don't think there's any argument there. Um, you know, I don't think that information comes, comes forward in, in the most productive way in Section 248. Uh, and then I would just echo others who, who would recommend that as you're considering this policy that you uh, really analyze <laughs> what are the costs, what are the benefits, and, and what are the goals. Uh, if, if the goals are climate, uh, carbon reductions, you know, that, I'm, I'm certain that there are multiple ways to achieve those goals. The, the goal is jobs creation. Again, uh, look, look at what's, what's the best way to achieve that. I haven't been shown that information, um, so, so I, I can't really weigh in on that right now. Sure. Um, and I, I know that uh, the prior witness uh, had, had some mentions of what the PUC is doing. Um, I may be able to answer any questions that you have. I may not because I wasn't, you know, I didn't prepare any advance to answer those questions. Um, <laughs> my sense is when we did Act 174, the goal was to have well-sighted generation, and well-sighted had two components. One, one was around aesthetics and planning, but and that planning also the goal uh, was also you know, from an engineering perspective, low generation next to load, minimizing infrastructure investment upgrades that would be required to add um, more distributed generation. For instance, I'm not sure that the process as it uh, rolled forward, achieved the engineering piece as well as it looked at pricing related to uh, preferred locations and that seems like from a town perspective, I'm seeing in retrospect that there it seems as though the towns are more interested in aesthetics rather than engineering. I, I would defer to Elizabeth, but in general I think I would agree with your summary. Well, yeah, I think developers are 
attracted to cheap land where they can develop PC and not attracted to places where they should be siting stuff. And that's part of the problem. And I, I believe when the previous witness said there have been no developments in the Shi'i, people from the department were shaking their head, which I think means that that was possibly inaccurate. And it's been my feeling uh, for several years, as the committee knows, that we we should have done something about that. And we should not allow further pressure in areas where renewable resources are being shut down every time the sun comes out because there's too much solar energy there. Because there's cheap land, there's still people trying to develop there. So um, anything more, Mr. Nauer? I, I, would, I would add, you know, I, I know that there was at least one case, uh, a large case that was denied in the Shiite region. Mm -hmm. My understanding, um, and uh, I, haven't, I haven't done the homework, I wasn't prepared to answer this question, but my understanding is that um, the utilities are objecting to larger projects uh, that are greater than 150 kilowatts, but that there um, may have been projects from 150 kilowatts and below that have been approved through the CDG process. Um, well, and I think it puts the utility in a tough position trying to fight those off everything, but uh, I think it's clear that at this point that area doesn't need any more 150s either. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so we're pressing along. We're going to run over a little. I'll ask our final witnesses to keep up the pace like everybody. Uh, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, join us. Thank you. Uh, ben Edgerly Walsh uh, with Deeper, uh, for the record. <laughs> uh, so thank you for taking a moment to hear from uh, uh, representative of the, of the environmental community this morning. I, uh, recognizing that time is brief uh, in this committee, checked with several of my colleagues and uh, Vermont Conservation Voters, Natural Resources Council, Conservation Law <coughs> Foundation, and Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility all uh, said that I could to a degree speak on their behalf, which I certainly appreciate. Um, so I just want to uh, start by saying that uh, VPIRG and those organizations are strongly in support of an additional component of in-state generation to complement a move to 100% renewable electricity. Uh, our feeling is that if we are using energy, we have a responsibility to generate more of it here. I would argue as much as we can. I don't think this bill goes nearly there, but it's a step in that direction. Uh, and that if we are moving to 100% renewable electricity, some of that should be coming from more uh, renewables being built here in Vermont. I'm not going to belabor the points that have been made on uh, grid resilience, uh, economic development, um, except to say that switching one imported energy source, uh, and fossil fuels, for another one is not uh, actually keeping more money in Vermont. Uh, and certainly, I, I would argue that that should be a goal, not the goal, that this is primary, primarily a climate bill, but having 10% uh, additional in-state is, is consistent with economic development goals that the state has. And, and I actually, I'll get to this in a second, and I will be brief. If done carefully, and I agree if it's not done carefully, this is not going to be achieved, but if done carefully and thoughtfully, this sort of build out of in-state renewables should and can <laughs> increase the resilience of our communities, our state, and our electrical grid. Uh, can I ask a question on that before we go on? Because Olivia also mentioned that, but yet the department and the utilities totally disagree. And I don't know how more solar development is going to get power to a house if the line is down. Yeah. That's a great point. So the couple of things that I would say to that. So one, having some additional generation of any kind in Vermont would, all other things being equal, make it more likely that power be available here rather than being reliant on imports. Just all things being equal, that, and there are many cases where, as you described, that would not be true. But all why, things why, why do so many other folks in the so in let me get business disagree with yeah, let me your get that. position? So I actually uh, agree with a lot of the comments that were made about the way this bill is at the moment drafted as it relates to energy storage and grid resilience. doesn't actually get there and doesn't achieve that goal. Uh, so one, 
the shall that's in the um, tier 2B section on energy storage. I agree that that's too prescriptive and uh, agree with uh, Ms. Bailey from BIPSA that in many cases that's not actually where you want storage. In some cases it is, in some cases it isn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, the point that was made around microgrids being designed around energy storage in DG is also uh, very relevant to this conversation and is not achieved simply by saying shall, have, you know, everything has to do this. Uh, so some uh, tweak to that, it could just be the May that uh, Ms. Campbell Anderson raised, it could be something else, but, but speaking to that concern. And then I'd also say the, um, the study at the end, the recommendations rather at the end, uh, that are specific and exclusive, I believe exclusive to section 248. Uh, I, I agree with the PUC's testimony that that can and should be broadened uh, to look at other tools that could better direct where DG and storage are actually placed and that there might be some opportunity to expand and strengthen that language to, to look at this picture more holistically rather than looking at that one tool in isolation. Um, Can I ask a quick question on that? Is there a process underway anywhere that you know of that's developing <coughs> those other tools? Uh, I am unaware of any. That doesn't mean they're not happening. To be blunt, I've been very focused on this building and not so much across the street for the last number of months. So apologies for not being able to bring that information. Um, a couple of other points I want to make, and then uh, and then one particular thing, just to one of the, the pieces the PUC brought. Um, so one, uh, this question of resource diversity, is this a solar requirement? It obviously is not. It may functionally become one. I understand that. However, that is in significant part a result of other decisions that the state has made about other resources in the past. So we can revisit those decisions and look at other resources, but I don't think it makes sense to sort of shoot the messenger like we are sort of stuck with solar as the tier, the tier two resource because of the policy decisions the state's made. Uh, Senator Rogers. Um, so uh, Ms. Anderson was on BPR and, and said that the cost of solar is going down. So are all you, because the cost is going down, are all your groups um, going to support the PUC in lowering the cost of net metering because that's where we're, it, it's not solar per se. If solar is done through a power purchase agreement, it can be very reasonable. Yeah. But we all know that solar net metering is the highest cost power that we're putting onto the grid right now. So I, I'm just wondering if all the environmental groups are going to support the PUC lowering what we're um, allowing the, the subsidy, the cost shift to be on net metering. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I'll say three quick things to it. One, uh, we were very supportive of Act 99 of 2014 that set the process in place that allows the PUC to lower rates or raise them or do whatever they think is appropriate under the criteria of that law. Uh, mm -hmm. Two, uh, we have been supportive of a cautious ratcheting down of those rates over time. And the question really is about the pace. Mm -hmm. If the pace is so dramatic that we are now excluding Vermonters who can't build five megawatt projects <coughs> themselves, from taking part in this, then that is concerning to us, that, that there needs to be some sort of a venue where individual Vermonters, small businesses, can actually go and, and be part of this revolution on energy themselves. So yes, we're supportive of reductions. I can't speak to any particular future reduction that they might propose. The last thing I'll say on that is, we also were uh, one of the first organizations, along with some of the other organizations I mentioned earlier, that brought forward the preferred locations uh, concept in the proceedings of the PUC and, and in this committee and another bill. Uh, and we felt like that was important because we were hearing concerns at the time about siting and about this being a uh, move towards clean energy overly reliant on uh, fields that farmers were leasing. And so, but a side effect of that has been that larger projects, uh, basically above residential sites, have largely been driven to those preferred locations brownfields, gravel pits, landfills, parking lots, almost all of which are more expensive to build. And so if we're looking at, you know, we really want to pull down the costs, then there are a few dials you can turn. You can open up some version of uh, easier to build, cheaper to build projects. 
uh, in, in some green fields, you can reduce permitting costs, which have been increasing over the last number of years. Um, I mean, you know, those are really the, or you can allow larger projects. So you, uh, your groups, though, don't take into consideration the cost shift to ratepayers. I would disagree with that characterization. I think it's one of the variables that we have to consider when we're looking at whether or not to support anything in the energy space, in the electric space. I'd, I'd like to just, I know your time is short. I don't want to cut this conversation. Over, a little over. So I know. Can uh, close so, on 267. Yes, okay. the last thing that I wanted to say um, is the point that was raised around uh, CEII or other FERC or federal regulations around uh, information that can be shared on the grid, there's actually language in uh, Act 170 of 2012 uh, around the standard offer that very specifically laid out uh, that that sh shall not run afoul of any of those kinds of requirements. So that could probably be lifted and applied to this study as well. Great. So that's like a data security provision? Essentially. I'm not deep on that, but there are, are reasonable restrictions at the federal level from a you know, terrorism standpoint, a security standpoint. We don't want to share too much about our grid and where it might be most Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Mazel. Here you are. Thank you. Good morning. Sorry, Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. I don't know if you were here when we started. You know, the basic she was. She was. She's, She's been here. Yeah. <laughs> we're all here. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The question number one. She knows what to do. All right. For the record, my name is Shana Loisel. I work for Vermont Electric Power Company. Uh, I was part of the Valco team that coordinated the 2012, 2015, and 2018 long range transmission plan. We're currently in the process of developing the 2021 Long Range Transmission Plan. My colleague Hans Presme was here on February 14th uh, giving an overview of Velco's grid, um, particularly around uh, the requirements that would be necessary to secure significant amounts of uh, additional in state renewable generation. So, Velco has been providing information uh, about the optimal location uh, for siting renewable generation since 2012. It was the first time that we began to see uh, an area in the northern part of the state uh, that um, we had reached its transmission capacity. Uh, and our message then was that location matters. Uh, new generation can aggravate uh, reliability concern if it's installed in the wrong location. So just jumping straight to the point, because I know we're, we're uh, low on time, among the strategies to have the greatest effect uh, to lower costs is to have generation in places that can cause the least harm uh, to the transmission grid. In 2018, uh, well, since that time of 2012, when we originally released the Location Matters map, uh, we've been working with, uh, to the extent possible, with large renewable developers seeking to build projects uh, and provide guidance to the system strengths and weaknesses and identify problematic areas uh, such as the Shi'ai area. Um, and we haven't been entirely successful. Uh, I mean, to be blunt, generation goes where it wants, regardless of grid impacts. Um, and in 2008, in the most recent long-range transmission plan, we sought to directly inform policymakers about what the grid needs to look like uh, for the policies that are being contemplated to be put into effect. In building off of that work and updated to reflect this bill, we developed three transmission cost scenarios, uh, a high, medium, low. It's the low end of $150 million in transmission upgrades, and the high end being 500, uh, with a, a, a mid scenario of 300 million dollars to accommodate an increase in in-state renewable generation. So this high cost scenario to, to low cost scenario, there are um, a lot of assumptions that go into that. We started working with our consultant that we developed uh, Vermont's long-range uh, plan forecast for all of those long-range plans. We started working with them to start uh, doing some preliminary analysis of what uh, the 20% uh, 
um, additional generation on the grid would look like and to see where uh, where those uh, upgrades and the costs associated with those would be. Um, largely speaking, geographic solar PV siting, if left unregulated, and large quantities of solar ins installations continue to take place in the northern and northwestern part of Vermont. This would lead to high cost scenarios. There are also some uh, assumptions around what uh, battery storage uh, does, and uh, particularly around the larger ISO New England projects with large merchant genera uh, generation being cited in Vermont. On the low scale, about 150 um, million, geographic solar PV siting uh, is regulated with large incentives or penalties. Um, and large quantities of solar installations would take place in southern Vermont, as depicted in the map that Mr. McNamara uh, has shared in his slide presentation we discussed uh, last month when we were here. Uh, from a transmission system reliability and cost perspective, there's th three real cost drivers for us as we develop these scenarios. The first being a stronger requirement for generation to provide transmission and or distribution upgrades at, uh, grid to provide grid benefits, not burdens to the system. The size and density of storage and specific purpose for which it's being used. And lastly, the dependence on the need for additional transmission upgrades. And that just remains to be seen. Um, and I think it's important to note that in any scenario, uh, we will have to do additional transmission work because these are the heart of the variables uh, in terms of what drives the cost. I think lastly, these initial estimates, as I said, are preliminary. Um, we hope to continue to work uh, with uh, ITRON and in coordination with the department and other stakeholders as we continue the analysis for the 2021 Long Range Transmission Plan to do a deeper dive into uh, this analysis of the true costs. So when you're talking about transmission, are we talking about reconducting lines and does that change substations along the way and basically you have to, the thing I'm trying to understand is if we're adding hundreds of megawatts of transient power, then um, does that change the nature of how what's moving in your system and how much capacity you have to have to move that around to maintain a stable grid? I think that is, is absolutely uh, one part of it. Uh, line reconductoring uh, could be one upgrade. I think that there there are other options to, to upgrades depending on what the project is. Um, any other questions for <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So, uh, thank you to everyone who. Uh, work promptly through testimony. We're going to take a 10-minute break and go to another topic.